Um, since my husband's passed away, I've tripled the company, uh, at least in revenue, and we've doubled the staff. So I'm not sure what you've been told prior, but let me tell you what I'm going to need. And then you can tell me what service you have fits that need. And so they're like, oh, shoot. You know, that happens more often than not. And now I'm having a lot of fun with it because I like to go in and, and let people expect very little of me and then come out hopefully surprised at how much I actually do know what I'm doing and have the experience that they didn't expect I had. Welcome to the Paid to Create podcast, where we dig into the secret strategies of successful creators making a lucrative living. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I just have to tell you about Katra, the marketing platform that has seriously transformed my business. You know how running a business can be insanely time consuming, right? Well, Katra has been a game changer for me. It's honestly like having an entire marketing team in my pocket. And what I love most is that it automates all the tedious daily tasks for me, from marketing to sales to even customer experience. I can't believe how much time and energy I've saved since I started using it. And get this. With Kartra, I can create websites, funnels, courses, membership sites, email campaigns, calendars, surveys, you name it. It's made managing my business so much simpler and more affordable. Honestly, I can't recommend Kartra enough. If you're curious, head to paidcreatepodcast.com backslash Kartra to start your trial. Trust me, you won't regret it. Welcome everyone to the Paid to Create podcast. I'm AJ Roberts. Alongside me as always is my co-host Sarah Jenkins. And I'm actually going to turn the mic on her today and interview her as I think you guys should get to know her. She's the CEO of Genesis Digital, uh, creators of Kartra, Webinar Jam, and Ever Webinar, which I am lucky to be a partner in. Um, but uh, Sarah, I figured we'd dive into your story and let the listeners learn a little bit about you today. So we'll avoid all the profanity, uh, drama, murders. Great. We'll go. We'll start with that. <laughs> yeah, let's keep it PG thirteen. Like we don't get banned <laughs> before we get started. So, um, why don't we just go back to, like, obviously now, virtual company employees all over the world. You know, major SaaS business, um, but you didn't start in software. Um, so why don't we go back to the beginning? Um, what was your first venture in online marketing? Oh shoot. Um, well, we learned. Uh, SEO, and we learned about websites, pages, emails slowly. I think one of the first questions when they joined the mastermind was, how do you get an email? Not just, you know, Sarah at Gmail. How do you get a professional email? Sarah at Justice Digital. Like, we had no idea how to do any of those things. So we started learning about the internets and then taught fitness marketing back in the day. And then we had an online fitness product first for our followers from our blog. You know, very rudimentary very beginning style. You do a blog, you do the content, you get the the leads and then you sell them a product, right? Yeah. So it's interesting there because you said you started to learn what, like for me, like when I got started, like I, you know, I took a, I took a job running a health club and I was learning about sales and then it was like, okay, what are the people who own this focused on? And they kept talking about marketing and things like that. And that's led me down my obsession with marketing. So I was like, oh, wait a minute. Like, like to sell something, you actually have to have someone in front of you to get that person in front of you. You actually have to market. So like, that was my first, like, Oh, it, the business is not the gym. The business is getting people to come in and sign up. The gym is the product, right? So for you, what was it that you said? Oh, okay. Like we've opened this business and, and now we got to get customers. Like, when did you say like, Oh, we have to learn about SEO and blogging and all those things that were so popular, you know, back in the 2000s. <laughs> well, my kids call me ancient. So apparently it was a really long time ago. Um, well, for when I hear you say that, that's you thinking with your entrepreneurial brain, thinking of how the business owner thinks. Most people don't think like that, but entrepreneurs do routinely. So when um, I started doing personal training, it was like you get clients by referral. Just like dentists, doctors, you get clients by referral. How, tell your friends and family about me. Um, but then when the internet started happening, you know, the dot com boom and all that stuff, we started looking at, well, what's a web page? What does it mean? What if we could get clients outside of people we know? You know, we can't get a billboard, we can't get a magazine print ad. We did do the Val Pack, that was pretty funny. Um, but then so we started to learn like what's what's a website? What would be an email? Like, what does it mean to be online? Um, and honestly, it started with Craigslist ads. Yeah. So, so you were leveraging um, Craigslist by advertising to get clients? Yeah. If you put something for free and well, what we did was super funny. Um, we did free models, personal training. And then when you met them, you'd say, can I use you as a testimonial? And then do you have any friends that would want personal training? Um, and back then, 
especially in Orange County, I mean, about 30 year old single, never married women that are looking at models with you are like, I want that trainer. And yes, we were a good trainer, but we also knew that's part of marketing. Cool. And then it just escalated from there. You just, the more you did, the more clients you guys got. Well, we were ahead because none of the personal trainers knew about websites either. We just started learning, okay, we can get clients on the internet with Craigslist. Okay, now we can get them on a website. We got the number one website in Orange County for personal trainers. And then we we're like, well, shoot, we have too many clients to handle. We started outsourcing our clients to other trainers that we knew that were quality. Um, and then they said, well, what are you doing? How do you get in all these clients? So we're like, oh, well, let me tell you. And then after a while it became... Um, sort of like we need to actually charge you for us to tell you because you're not only taking our clients, <laughs> you're going to get better than us at it. You have more energy um, and we have something valuable to provide. Yeah. So the transition came from essentially you maxed out and other people could see that and, and then they wanted to pick your brain. That's the, the, the entrepreneur's worst thing to hear from someone. Let me pick your brain for five minutes. But you know, then you saw the opportunity like, oh, we could actually teach this and, and, and package what we've done and, and share it with others. Well, I think most people get into business to, to, for something good. Like we're doing pay to create. You're paid to create something as a doctor, whether it's health, service, medicine, whatever. If you're a lawyer, you're taught to create, you know, court wins and documents and contracts. So for an entrepreneur, you're paid to create whatever you're passionate about. And if you're a personal trainer, that was, I mean, you know, you're trying to get someone fit or make their goals lifting or look better. Like those, you're, you're trying to get in that to help somebody, but then you end up making money from it, which is cool. So we take that to the next level. Now you're going to help other people make money and they can help more people. So you still have that mindset. So it's interesting because you mentioned you got, you outsourced versus like building a bigger team. And what was the decision that, because a lot of people struggle when it comes to outsourcing, like, especially as they build their business, like, and, and trainers are a great, uh, a, a great example of this, but I, I look at it as anybody that is, is uh, creating an income via their skill set, right? Because they're getting paid to actually do the skill. So as a trainer, you're getting paid to train somebody, right? Well, you're limited by how many hours are in the day. The only way to multiply yourself like in person is, is to expand with other people, right? Online, obviously you can put the information into something and sell it. So what was the decision for you guys to say like, oh, like, let's outsource the training to other people versus like, let's build a franchise or let's build like a huge gym or something like that. Well, we actually had small goals. So we had, let's say, um, group training was just popular, which meant you didn't have one-on-one -on -one clients. You could train five clients at a time, six clients at a time, if you were really good. And everyone would still get really great results. You're not losing the quality there, but we wanted to give other clients that saw our website, saw our testimonials, a quality experience too. So we went to other trainers that were doing group training because for them to fit one more person in their group of four means nothing to them. And they still get that quality service, but we'll only take half the money. So we're providing the client they do the training, it fits right into their schedule as it is, and we're making sure it's a benefit to both. Um, we could have scaled and hired employees and stuff, but I think with, with fitness, it's ripe for stealing clients. Once you know you can train, you can take your clients and go to any gym you want, um, which is not the way we thought about it. We thought mutually beneficial. We'll give you a great trainer. You found us through this website. We're giving the trainer a good client. We'll take the money and pay everybody. So it takes the admin hassle out of the trainer's life. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's something to look at too, right? It's like that and just summarizing that the headache of having to hire people versus like, Hey, you're already doing this. You're very good at it. Let us slide an extra client in there. We'll give you, you know, 50% or whatever. Um, to that person, it's like, Oh, it's a free person that they're now getting 50% to you guys, 50% for doing nothing. Basically. Yep. Um, what were some of the early challenges with the online stuff, with the SEO, the blogging, like all the different components that you guys suddenly were, were implementing into the business? Well, we started cheap. We started um, using the little babysitters we had for the girls to write articles on local stuff. Just, hey, here's, write an article on Lake Forest and say Lake Forest 19 times and include a bunch of fitness stuff. And so we'd pay them to write an article while the kids were sleeping. And it was this easy Google stuff before Google smacked everyone for doing that. Did that Google slap affect the business a lot? Like I, for, for me, and uh, I have another friend, we learned through arbitrage that you could essentially create an affiliate site using a uh, the same name as the company you were promoting with a .net or .gov extension or whatever we could get. And we could build a WordPress site. We could get it to rank. And it normally rank one or two, depending on on how good the, the main site was. And then, of course, brand search. People would search, and then they would click on our site, which had kind of some 
articles and, and reviews, and then they would purchase the product. So we were making a lot of money off of, we had a lot of sites in order to do it, but we were making sales every day. Google came along and just slapped that. And I lost every site that was on page one. Did you guys experience kind of a similar thing? We had that with local um, fitness for sure. SoCal Workout is not the number one fitness site anymore. It way jumped off the front page. Um, Google noticed we were doing that and it wasn't quality articles. We were just keyword stuffing to get the ranking, which is, you know, the tricks of the internet before we learned, oh, that's not okay. Oh, here's why it's not okay. Um, you know, back then it was the Wild West. You just do what you got to do. Now it's black hat. So you can't do that. You know, or gray area marketing where it's not, you know, pristine and blessed by the Google. Yeah. <laughs> so did you guys pivot the marketing then go white hat or did you take it like go a different direction? Oh, we took a huge dive, dive in sales for, for our fitness business, but our, our online fitness marketing business was ramping. So now we're like, okay, now we have something else to teach you. Here's where Google has just punished all of us for doing all these things. We already learned, we already got hurt by it. So let's teach you how to not do that. So we actually used it to our benefit um, when the housing market crashed. Gotcha. So you, that's interesting because I know in around 2008, I was involved in a consulting company too. And it was like, that the market's crashing, but people were flocking towards us to say like, what do we do? Like, how do we do this? And so you just, you guys naturally rode that wave and kind of transitioned into the, 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 the info coaching business. When your income is not guaranteed by your boss or your clients, your clients are losing income because they're real estate guys in their twenties making baller money. Now they're not making anything. Um, when the internet has been smacked by Google and they said your articles are actually no good, not providing any value. Um, you really start to explore your other options. Um, and that's when we did the the fitness product online. But for us, I guess we had a lot of technical troubles with that. Yeah. We'll get into that a little bit. Well, it's embarrassing for me to say, but one of the first conversations, like the first conversation that you and I had was I was hooking up our, our one shopping cart account with our, you know, what automation was and our website and stuff. And you had to do the API clicks perfect. You had to have the codes done. It was timed. And I was like, this is so out of my depth. I'm good at taking clients' money, making sure they have great training. That's my experience. So I was like, can you help me with this API thing? And then I found out you're like the strongest guy in the world. I was like, how do you know about API and tech? And I'm sitting here struggling and I have a fitness marketing business. It's unfair. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> th th that was a weird call because it was like one little thing was wrong in the one shopping cart, right? It was going to prevent the whole launch. I couldn't find it. Um, <laughs> but like, it, so it had come from, for me, basically, like when I learned marketing was was everything, right? And and then marketing never stops. It's, bef it's before the sale, it's during the sale, it's after the sale, especially if you're in a reoccurring business. Um, the thing was, is back then is there wasn't tools to do all the things you needed to do. So you'd have these ideas like, okay, like how do we get more money during a sale? Like the, the average order value, how do we increase that? Okay. So if someone buys this, they may want this. So we, we want to present them with a secondary offer. Oh, well, how are we going to do that? Well, we, we, we actually have to store the credit card information like securely in the back end, pass it to the next web page. If the person says yes, grant them access. Like this complexity was huge. So for me, it was like, we would have these ideas, but like we didn't have anybody to figure it out. So I just figured it out. Right. And so that was, it was like funny because it was like the, to me, it was the least important thing that I did. Cause I was all about the strategy, all about like the actual campaigns, but like without back then, without the tech, you couldn't make it happen. And it was so expensive to try to hire people. Um, and that was like my, my first website, there's a three page website that I had built that cost $25,000, you know? Um, and I'm sure you guys experienced the same thing before WordPress, like WordPress changed the game for everything. Yeah. WordPress made it easy for the average user, which is what we hope to continue. Yeah. <clears throat> oh man. Yeah. You can't do what you want to do in marketing without the tech, but I think you as a business owner so, saw when you were in the gym, you're like, okay, so somebody comes in and they want the membership Monday through Friday till 5 PM. But if they want the increased membership, then they get nights and weekends. Then if they want the, the free towel or the water bottle. So you can see upsides or upsells in every business you do. For us, it just happened to be fitness, which was really cool because we could easily see how to upsell someone on something else they need and how to provide that next item. Yeah. So moving into internet marketing and SaaS, like what were some of the things that like carried over um, for you, some of the biggest lessons that you learned that kind of set the foundation for the success that you've had? Well, for physical products, for coaching products, you are the brand, you are the face. So software, you don't necessarily have to be. You don't see as much success if you're more like Nike as, uh, as opposed to Tony Robbins, but um, you get 
more easier recurring income because your software is doing a job that you promised it does most of the time. Um, and then you don't have to put out the next product, think of the next product. So it's far less creative, but it's a lot more work heavy in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, it's expensive to, to set up. Well, it's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. Work, work time and money expensive to do software. So let me ask you this, knowing what you know, right? So like info marketing, information marketing to me is one of the easiest businesses to get into. And the reason I say that before anybody freaks out is, is the barrier to entry is literally, you just have to have an audience to sell something to, right? Like you can deliver a word doc to them. Like people don't care. They buy the information. How it's delivered is very often not a concern of theirs, right? And in fact, a lot of people would rather have a one page document that gives them exact steps than to watch 40 hours of video to try to figure it out. Um, the profit margin as well on an information business is usually more like 80% profit, right? So it's a huge profitable industry. SaaS is not so much. So what has been the driving factor for you with software? Like why do it? Why continue to do it? Well, back in the day when we did um, we did the Video Boss launch, it was our information products, hugely profitable. Um, once you do the one course, you sell it to as many people as you can, and then all that is profit. I mean, after you pay the merchant fees and your website builder. Um, but when we did that, the Bossathon, eight hours of video hosting, and it cost $100,000. We're like, shoot, there's got to be a better way to host video and sell products. Um, especially our products. So we'd like to create that. And if we create something that's valuable, we could sell it and it would help other entrepreneurs. Um, it goes back to sort of the beginning. Usually you get paid to create something that's your passion or something that you want to do. And for us, a lot of it was helping people. So if you made, we did the video boss, which taught you all about making video and video makes more money than anything online. We actually still believe that, but we're trying to tell people that are uncomfortable on camera. You don't have to be on camera. You could do slideshows. You could do AI voiceovers, but you still need to be video. Um, and so that led us to create the very first software because we saw the need so glaringly obvious to us and we wanted to use it. Yeah. I think, and I, and I haven't, fortunately, being in some of those conversations, being a fly on the wall and, and giving input and feedback, like one of the things that I saw was we were able to do things that we couldn't teach to the audience. And the reason was either we had the skill set, you know, um, uh, it, to be able to do, it was a skill that they didn't have, you know, like programming or high end video editing or something like that. And so, yes, you could spend the time teaching them that, but to, to do a launch and to make all of that happen, you know, often we would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and, you know, the upside of that was we would make millions, but the average person struggled right? Like they didn't have the resources. They didn't have the funding. So they would try to essentially duplicate our efforts and, and they couldn't, right? They, they couldn't build what they needed to build. And so one of the things we, we noticed was like the software we were using, it really didn't work that well. And then it was like the prices just kept going up. And now I, knowing what I know now, I understand because most software companies rely on other people's money to build it, right? They're not self-funded. They raise money, they burn the money, they go raise more money, right? So oftentimes their pricing is not what it should be. It's what they think they can get. So oftentimes it's very underpriced. And I won't say any names, but there's a, a video hosting platform that is notorious for having unlimited for like 99 bucks a month. But if you hit a certain uh, bandwidth threshold, they'll send you a bill for like $3,000 and then say you need to leave the platform. So um, like Weird. we saw that. And I think that was the, the one of the driving forces with the software was like, if we're going to be teaching people how to do things, like they need to be able to actually do them. Well, and the thing with software is it takes away some of those guessing games. It takes away some of the tech issues with the API. Like if your merchant account broke back in the day, oh man, you could make no sales for two days and not notice because nobody told you anything broke. You just had to go, wait, why... Why have I had no sales for two days? Oh, shoot, the API is broken again. So we've picked those kinds of issues for people that are not tech savvy and didn't know their way around those different features. But also we took away the need to put all those features together by by doing Karcher in the first place. And then they didn't have to get, you know, the, the pro programmers and the pro editing necessarily. They could just put it on as modules and a membership site. So we've really created something fantastic along our own hard times. 
everything gets easier. And I don't think people remember like what it was like before. Right. So like, I always laugh when the airplane, the Wi-Fi doesn't work and people are having meltdowns and it's like, like, 10 years ago, there was no Wi-Fi, you know, like, so these are the kind of things that like, it becomes an expectation, you know, drag and drop, simple this, simple that. And I don't think people realize like the fact that you can build an entire website funnel, like set up a product, like all of that in literally one day, if you, if you, if you, you know, worked your butt off, like, like that's huge. It used to take months to build these things, right? It was, we'd be up till 4 a.m. the day before a launch checking everything because it's just that complex. But I want to shift gears a little bit because one of the skills that I've seen you as the CEO, as a, as a, a female entrepreneur do, which is, is phenomenal, um, is being able to build really strong teams around yourself, right? Um, what are some of the things that you have done that you think have helped bring in a players into roles that allow it allow your job to be easier um well i mean yourself included you've worked for me many times partner with me now work with me for fun like we hang out like it's um i mean you like being around me so there must be something there right <laughs> but um as far as my staff goes we we start at the very very beginning you are in the industry you're paid to create is something that you're passionate about so you start with fitness and it's to help somebody look better or feel better. And if you make money in the process, great, because you have to make money to live. Um, but it's the same thing with employees. It has to be mutually beneficial. Am I paying enough that it makes sense for you? What job are you providing? Um, can I lift you up and show you that there's opportunity in my business as well as what you're doing now, but for future growth? And if I can do all those things, we'll have a very happy partnership. And so I look at all of it sort of as partnerships. Even um, anyone that answers a customer service ticket or enters a chat, um, to service a client of mine is, is just as important as I am. They're doing something in that day to bring in the revenue and help the client. The reason we built the software was to help the client. The reason we have employees is to help the families, um, to help grow revenue for the shareholders. Um, so it's, it's got to be always that beneficial mindset and that mentality of lifting each other up and you'll all grow together. Yeah, I love that. I think that, that, that for a lot of people, that's unusual, right? Because a lot of people have the like, you're here to do a job that I pay you to do. If you don't like it, you can leave, right? Like they don't see it as a, like they see it as I pay you. That's what you get from me. And I get from you, your hours, right? Um, so to have that mindset of like, what, how do we fit together? Like beyond just the transaction, right? I think is, is, is key. On the flip side, what are some things you've experienced that make someone not so good. Like what are some red flags? What are things to look for, for people that aren't the right fit? Because I know you've had your fair share of those and they've been sometimes very expensive lessons. Well, I work really, really hard. Um, when I fire someone, if I ever fire someone to make sure I'm really thinking about it humbly, cause this is their, their income, their family, you know, everything they count on to provide housing for their children. It's, it's, on my company if they work for me. So I take that very, very seriously. But if somebody isn't subscribing to, um, well, I guess sort of the mutual respect, if I see supervisors who are being demeaning or they're not listening to their own, like we've had some people would just start screaming at their manager and I'm like, what in the world? Like in what world can you scream at somebody and make it out okay? Like, I don't know what you're thinking that you think that's an acceptable response to a hopefully productive criticism, but even a harsh criticism, be able to handle it, you know? Um, so I think a lot of our staff has, has to go through that mutual respect sort of mentality. And if they just don't have it, then they really don't make it very far. Yeah. Now, someone is interested and in, I'll highlight this because, um, what we've talked about this off camera many times. And one thing you have in the company is a, is a coach to, for, to help people with their personal development. Um, and to help them grow individually so they can have crucial conversations, they can deal with conflict, they can manage and control themselves, almost emotional intelligence training, right? Um, for you, why is that important? Because a lot of people think that like, hey, this is my company, I'm not responsible for that stuff. What what was the trigger for you to say, you know what, like, like I'm going to take some of that responsibility on and help these people grow as individuals as well as employees? Well, if you're looking to be a good leader, if you're looking to be a strong leader, which I didn't have a choice in doing, I don't think I was a strong leader before. I think Andy was a strong leader. I think he was a great leader for our family and the company. Um, but when that hole was there after he'd passed away, then I had to fill it somehow. And being in a big family, a big religious family, which is really fun, having as many kids as I have, I've got five. Um, if you don't have 
like not just the mutual benefit, but then the instruction with the love, your kids are going to resent you. Like they've certainly gone through those periods. I've got teens now that they're just, we'll, we'll see what happens, but we're guiding with as much love as possible. So what happened was I talked to Evan Pagan and he said, you need to go to your employees now that Andy has, has passed away and everybody is feeling the loss. They're feeling the grief. It's your husband. It's your you know, father of your kids. But for them, it was their boss. So they actually do look up to him. They actually work for you for a reason. They like being there. Um, most of our staff stay for years and years. So you need to actually go and make sure they're okay too, even though it's not necessarily your job, even if it's not comfortable. Um, if you want them to stay with you, if you don't want them to be wildly fearful of their future with you, if you want them to stay in their job and stay happy and grounded, get a counselor and see if you can meet some of their needs emotionally and they'll, well, there's a law of reciprocity. They'll respect it. They'll like it. They'll feel more loyal and endeared to you in the company. And you did look beyond the revenue. You spent a little money to make sure they were okay because they are in a hard situation. Yeah. I mean, that was, a, that was a very hard time um, for, for everybody, right? Uh, yourself included. And I know, obviously I know a lot because <laughs> I went through it with you. Um, You're in the room. But <laughs> What for you, right? You mentioned that you didn't feel like you were a good leader before, right? What was the decision? Because you, you just to be clear, like you, you were the vice president of the company. You were involved in in it daily, right? So it's not like you were on the sidelines. Like you were heavily involved in, from the beginning. Um, and and like you mentioned earlier, we'd worked on and off together for for over a decade. So it, it wasn't as if, as if you just all of a sudden were like, oh, okay, like now I'll go figure out what this is doing. Like you, you were integra integrated into the company. You managed a lot of people and like were involved heavily. What made you decide instead of sitting back and saying, okay, like, like I'm going to step away and, and process everything and I'm going to take my time and just, I'm going to allow someone else to run the company. What made you decide to step into the CEO role? Because I know we had a lot of conversations. You had a lot of doubt. I'm a female. You know, I was the wife of, of the, 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 the founder. Like, what was it that, because like, I remember saying to you, like, well, if you think you should, you should. But what was it that even made you start to feel that this was the right path for you and the company? Well, you could take it two different ways. You could take it like, I've always been a very strong supporter. So if you look at the pastor's wife or... You know, for me, I was Andy's with the boss's wife. So VP, I was controlling a lot of things. I was doing payroll, but my main job was to support and uplift Andy, the boss, my husband, and then support and uplift the people that worked for him. So they felt good working there. They made sure they were heard, you know, without bothering Andy. My job was to completely support him. So then stepping into what would, what would be the leadership role, um, I looked at it the same way. My job is still to encourage and support and uplift my staff. Um, but from a revenue perspective, I could hire out the CEO business and go sit on a beach. And that probably would have been lovely for a while, would have gotten bored. But um, also it's, it's not financially worth it. So if I hire a CEO, that's not me. It doesn't have the heart of the company. It doesn't have the encouragement and um, the challenge I can give my employees. Then I'm paying for something that I could have done and done better, I think. Maybe if I'd hire a CEO, I'd have a little bit more money right now, but I think the profit margins would be lower because the turnaround would be higher. Because I do, that is one thing I do do really well is I, I hire good, strong people to come alongside me and build the company. It's To me, there is a there is an org chart, but it is not necessarily a hierarchy. It's a partnership. We're all growing this thing together, no matter what level you're on communication-wise in the org chart. Um, so that's why I had to turn it around and say, okay, if I hired out financially, it's not as wise a move. So if you look at when going back to the counseling thing, um, if my employees are are happier and more loyal and working with, you know, people that they know or have connected with on the internet, they're going to stay longer. It's going to save me a lot of money. Hiring is expensive. Firing is more expensive. And then replacing that person is expensive. There's the learning curve. It's a software, you know, they're not loyal anymore. So they might not give me their best effort. What I have in a lot of my employees that I've certainly felt, or they've told me, um, is that they are happy to be there. And so happy workers give me better work. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things as VP that you, you made the decision was to, to create a virtual company a hundred percent. Right. And I remember we, we had an office, we had a, a dozen or so people there and, you know, we did. Um, and one day it was, oh, we were going back to work from home, which I couldn't love more because I'm a hermit and I love to be in the cave studying, creating, and then come out, present it to the world and then go back to my cave. So that was a big happy moment for me. But, you know, now having as many 
uh, employees as 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 you do uh, and global staffing as, as we have what was the decision to go virtual and what has been for those that may be thinking about it you know because covid bought a COVID created a lot, but a lot of people have forced their staff to go back to work or, or have kind of a hybrid schedule for those that like maybe thinking about it. Like, I think it'd be good for you to share kind of, you know, your, your thoughts and opinions on, on the right way to do it and share your lessons learned from it. Well, I think it starts back at the original hiring. If you're hiring the quality people that can give you the work that you need, I don't need to micromanage. I don't need to see that you're at your desk at 8 AM and, and leaving at four or five I don't need to see you in the office, so to speak. So, so, you, I, so you don't have spyware on their I computer. I do not. Watching. No, <laughs> I've, I've thought about it, but it creeped me out a lot. So I was like, I don't, I don't think. Well, I don't want that on my computer. So I have it on my kids, but it's whole. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I don't. I don't like to micromanage for for the most part. If somebody's not not succeeding in their role, then I'll micromanage for a moment to see if they can they can then succeed, or do they have to go somewhere else? And that's mutually beneficial too. If they're not succeeding, they're not going to be happy and fulfilled. If they don't belong in that role. It's best for them not to be there. Um, but with the remote thing, yeah, I remember I came to the office and I sent everybody home. I was like, you go home, you come here. And I was not in charge at all. And Andy was like, oh, <laughs> I was just, I was done with the shenanigans, the office lunches I'm always paying for. Andy's home late. I miss my husband. We have a baby. She just doesn't get to see her dad all the time. Um, one of our employees snuck into the office at a pool party at night. So that's like, oh, liability. Oh, sweet pea. You're such a teenager. Like, I can't have that. So if you work from home and you want to do your laptop work on the computer at the pool, you go for it. We have a, a new employee who's worked at Google and he said, man, the campus was really great. It was like a playground. I said, actually, with Genesis Digital, you have that same opportunity. You can take your computer and go straight to a playground if you want. Isn't that great? And he's like, yeah, funny. <laughs> Yeah, it is nice. If you want a nap, you got your own bed. If you're hungry, you got your own food. Like you, you got exactly what you want, you know, um, you create your own environment. Um, it used to be a unique selling proposition. I was like, hey, I could I could actually, well, this is me sort of riding trends again. Um, when I sent everybody home, I'm like, there's less insurance, there's less liability, there's no office costs, there's no home internet costs. And since then, things have changed. Now I have to provide the internet for my employees, you have to provide them a cell phone if they need to work. But those all laws came later. So I saved a ton in the beginning and if somebody was working from home, they're not buying lunches out. They're not paying for gas. They're not sitting in their commute. They have better home lives. So it was a mutually beneficial thing before COVID made it popular and I lost all my edge. So n knowing what you know and, and with the, the home stuff, and I think I'll, I'll just, the one thing I'll add is like the, you mentioned earlier, the right people seem to find that, you know, some people need an office, right? Some people need, cause like they feed, like they're very extroverted. If they're at home, they kind of, they get lost, like they need to be around people, you know, like if they're not on conference calls because they need connection, um, they don't usually do well. But w would you say there's even a need? Like, would you ever have an office? Like, is there a need for an office? No, I don't see myself ever going to an office. If you have a need to be social, we did have one employee that was like, hey, I'm not thriving here. I'm lonely. I'm at home all the time. I've got nowhere to go. She lived in a rural area. So she felt like her... Um, her work life was kind of killing her as a person, which as an extrovert, it is. So we encouraged her to go get a WeWork desk and we would happily supplement that cost. So if you are social and you still are exploring work from home, work socially, go work at a WeWork office, go find people to go hang around that have similar interests or can uplift you as a person and feed that energy that you need. But the work from home thing, the work wherever you want is not going anywhere. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. There's so many with co-working spaces, there's so many opportunities to be in a in a office environment that's that's not your office, um, and it may actually be better because then you don't end up dating if you're single and you're in that environment. You don't end up dating anyone from from work. I remember when I toured Facebook, one of the things they said was like, when two people at Facebook start dating, they have to sign a contract that says if they break up, they both have to leave the department because if they're dating within the same department, they both have to leave um, to prevent any issues. So um, this is su super interesting there. Um, looking at your role as the CEO, being a female, right? You know, we go to a lot of places and there's not many female CEOs that are, uh, in comparison to males, right? Like when we go to these events, the masterminds or, or conferences, like usually the majority of speakers, the majority of the audience are male, Go even further, there's very few female CEOs who have built an eight-figure business, right? Um, 
you know, valued over nine figures, whatever you want to say. Um, what has been some of the, the, the hardest things? Because obviously you knew when you took, when you stepped in, there was going to be challenges. You knew there would be stress that you haven't experienced before. But what are some things that you've faced that, that you were, have been surprised by or you weren't expecting? So many things. <laughs> Typically the male is the breadwinner still. I mean, in America, statistically, that's just the way it is. And then men have been in the workforce longer, so more of them are men. So, you know, when the CEOs are in their 50s and 60s, it's because they've been in the workforce a lot longer. And 40 years ago, their wives were at home having their kids, which is totally great. Nothing nothing wrong with that at all. But it's now it's it's changing a little bit. So it's more equal. So women are like, oh, hey, I can have a kid and then go back to work. So that's sort of a new thing in the last you know, 50 years, which is great. But that's why we don't see many people in the boardroom masterminds. And it's a little disappointing because I'm always trying to look for myself when I'm in the mastermind. So if I have a question, um, you know, and I'm in a room of, you know, 70 men and 20 women, I'll sort of gravitate towards the women and say, well, what do you do with your business? And, and a lot of times they're not the ones on stage. They're not the ones that are leading some of the conversations, which is disappointing. Uh, as far as things that surprise me, um, I don't know. Challenges, like being a female in the CEO role, what are challenges you've had to like, you know, really fight? And I, I, I kind of, I'm lead, I'm trying to lead you here. Cause I, 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 I you already know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just mean like, like you, <laughs> you know you, me really well. So you, you've mentioned fair. before, like certain conversations you've had with people that are that underestimating you, the the acting like, oh, it's just, you're just a woman or, oh, it's just, you know, Andy's wife. Like I know those two combined have been, been, you face that many times in many conversations, not just with one person. It's, it's been a, a reoccurring Most. conversation you and I have had about that. Well, it's, it's, it used to frustrate me a lot. And now it's one of my favorite things. It's um actually become something I have a lot of fun. I have a shirt. This is underestimate me. That'll be fun. Um, but I, I do understand that Andy was the leader and he certainly set me up for some giant success. When we got married, he didn't marry me because he had all the money. I had my own million dollar business. He married me because he thought we would be a power couple. We could really support each other and combine our collective strengths, me and admin and, and happiness and accounting and his and, and leadership and creativity. So um, when I go into these meetings after being you know, Andy's wife, I've had, man, so many where it's, it's me in a room of like, nine gentlemen in their fifties. And I'm like 32. I'm like, Hey. <laughs> and so they'll start telling me like, oh, okay, so, so you're, you're taking over this business and here's how we're going to help you learn how business works and, and help you know how to grow. And I was like, okay, um, great. I think you've been misled. Um, since my husband's passed away, I've tripled the company at least in revenue, and that we've doubled the staff. So I'm not sure what you've been told prior, but let me tell you what I'm going to need. And then you can tell me if what service you have fits that need. And so they're like, oh, shoot. You know, that happens more often than not. And now I'm having a lot of fun with it because I like to go in and, and let people expect very little of me and then come out hopefully surprised at how much I actually do know what I'm doing and have the experience that they didn't expect I had. Yeah. So I think it's important, for, like, especially for like hopefully the men listening start to go, okay, maybe I shouldn't underestimate anybody that's in front of me. Right. Um, but for, for the, for the women listening, like what is some advice you have for them? Because I'm juggling five kids, right? Like you mentioned earlier, you have a, you have a large family, like you are a mom, you are a CEO, you're a mom to all the employees technically too. Like the way you look at it, like you, you take that responsibility on, like, what are some things that you would say to a female who, who's maybe like starting or struggling in her role, you know, just to continue to persevere, to continue to keep going? Well, the mom guilt is huge. We have that everywhere. I even had one of my nannies say, I don't really want to work here anymore because even though my son is here at the house every day with the kids and goes to the same school as the kids, like I only see him for two or three hours giving him personal attention. I don't feel good about it. I was like, well, then we have to change your schedule because I can't have that. You know, I don't want another mom working for me that doesn't feel good about it. But she didn't also give herself the balance she needed. So she didn't say, okay, well, my son's at school. I can get stuff done for Sarah. And then when my son's out of school, then take those hours. Like she couldn't find the solution to her own problem. Um, I helped provide that for her, but that's another story. So I think a lot of moms come in and they say, oh, shoot, I've got this baby. I've got to do lunches in schools and then homework. And they're not providing themselves the care for their kids. Like I'm not saying go hire a nanny. I'm saying what can you do to lower your own bandwidth so you can focus on your company 
where it's most important, where you can give the best value, give your kids love and attention they deserve. You have to be very compartmentalized and very organized in where you're going to put your space and your energy, including for yourself. Like there's not a week go by. I don't, I don't get my nails done. Yeah. Uh, let's get, let's talk a little bit about that creating bandwidth. Like, because I think that that, it, it kind of goes back to the originally the outsourced idea you had, which was like, oh, I don't want to create more work for myself, but we, we don't want to lose out on this revenue. So let's create a good partnership. How is that transferred into your home life? Because like, you didn't always have nannies. You didn't like, you have a lot of people in your life that allow you to uh, focus on what's important. And, and when you have time, spend quality time with people. So like, what are some things you do to make sure that you have quote unquote balance, even though true, but you know, we know it's not an even scale, but balance and sanity. <laughs> balance enough that I can get behind it. So if I'm, you know, asking myself, giving myself those pause moments where I can say, okay, this week, when am I giving my kids the attention they deserve? In what ways could I show it to them? So Thursday, I'm going to make dinner with the kids. You know, Saturdays, we're going to have a video game day on the couch. So I'm purposefully putting that into my calendar of this is the times where I'm going to be fulfilled as a mom and they're going to get the time for me that I think they need. Some weeks, they need more than I was able to give. And some weeks, they needed less than I was sitting around waiting for them to play with me. Um, usually, that's not the case. Usually, we're all very busy. But the same thing with your company. If so I've got uh, a book coming out in, I think, June. And I was just talking to a PR person. She said, well, we can get you onto you know, TV shows and, and morning shows and, and, and articles and stuff, but we need you to write a bunch of articles. I said, well, that's a non-starter. I'm not going to spend more of my time not talking to my employees I have now, my kids I have now, give my husband the attention he deserves now. That's just not going to fit. I'm never going to sit down and write an article at this stage of my life. Maybe if I'm CEOing less or my kids are a little older, then I'll spend a little bit more time writing. But the balance thing, you've got to give yourself some breaks, man, some credit. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I learned earlier was I call it like outsourcing the $20 an hour tasks, right? Like once you know what you can make per hour, right? And, and, and it's not what you think you can make, it's what you actually make. So what did you make last year? Divide that by how many days a week you work. Divide that by, you know, the, the hours that you work. You know, if you work 40 hours a week. Like, what's that number, right? And if it's $100 an hour or even $50 an hour, like you shouldn't do anything that you can pay someone less than that to do for you. And it's a very difficult concept to understand because you think to yourself like, well, I'm not going to pay someone to, to, you know, cook my food, for example. Like, oh, I'm not going to use a meal service. But you could. But, <laughs> but like, if you prep your food, it takes two to three hours, right? So if you get paid 50 bucks an hour, that's 150 bucks. You can buy your entire food for the week for less than 150 bucks. The key is you have to know how to leverage those three hours that you just bought yourself, right? Because you essentially you buy back your own time. And the mistake people make is they buy it back and then they don't do anything with it. So the guilt sets in, right? Like, oh, I'm just sitting on the couch not doing anything. So why should I, like, I should just do that myself. You have to know if you, like, you have to learn that you buy back time to then use that time either for the business or for yourself or for your family, right? You have, and I think like one of the things I've noticed with you and correct me if I'm wrong, but like you pretty much live and die by your schedule now. Um, you know, you always say, if it's on my calendar, it'll get done. Um, you know, has, has that been a, a big thing for you to like, you know, get organized like that? Because as a creative, right? Like I kind of like, like, controlled chaos i say you know and sometimes like when my calendar's full it almost gives me anxiety like so is that something you've learned to love no so we had um we started with an in-home personal assistant and so the personal assistant would come in and do payroll and then do the dishes and then take out the trash and leave by noon so we had a bunch of things done in the house that we weren't doing anymore but back then it was much much cheaper um, but we paid for those services for the hour and they did whatever we needed them to do. So we slowly figured out what we didn't need to do. You know, when we were on a stage of that, uh, commitment summit, I said, why are you doing things on Sunday that take away from your business or your children? Why are you folding your own laundry? Good Lord. I think there's a service, unless you're in the super rural areas, that's pretty affordable to get it done. Even right. an in-home personal assistant that will come and pick up your kids' toys for you, fold your laundry, load your dishwasher and leave. How much could that possibly cost? And how many hours of frustration will that buy you? Um, some one mom I was talking to doesn't homeschool anymore because she said, listen, I'd rather be a good mom. I'm not a good teacher. And now I'm be not being a good teacher and I'm not being a good mom. I'm like, oh, well, that's she knows where she needs to put her time and her her limits. So you kind of I think you grow into it. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the things um, 
I was guilty of was having a partner at home and expecting them to want to do all those things, right? Like, well, you're at home. So like, why don't you do the dishes and the laundry? And, and then you realize that like, they don't want to do that either. Right. So that's so weird. You know, <laughs> doesn't and, want to do the dishes. And when they don't do it, they have a lot more time for you. And, and so that that's kind of a, you know, like one of the things I learned that's, so I, I didn't necessarily do it to buy back my time. I bought, I did it to like free up time so that I could spend with my partner. Right. Increase um, happiness. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about your book a little bit. Cause, um, what, first of all, what's the title of it? Working title is Alpha Female Leadership. Cool. And what made you decide to to write a book? Officially, book lends credibility to you. Um, I like books. I love movies, but I don't learn or remember a lot about movies. I just enjoy that time watching them. But books, I really gravitate towards. Maybe it's my learning style. And I remember parts of different books that really have changed the way I've been thinking about things. And I don't see a lot of... Um, women in roles that are, I won't even say comforting, but enthusiastically challenging. So when I'm looking at other women CEOs, and I don't know very many, and I'd like to know more, but there aren't as many, and they're harder to get a hold of. And a lot of times on a big stage, they come across very, very fake and very, I'm just a millionaire and it's great. And I'm like, well, I'd like to know how you got there though. Like, I want to know more of when you're speaking, what I can take home to change my own life or my own business. And I just don't see that very often. I'd love to see that more often. So I'm doing the book so that other women can feel like they can step up and start being that leader for whoever's in their tribe or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, Alpha has got a negative connotation to it, but for me, it's not. It's it's that that almost mothering guidance of here's where we're going to all go find the food. Here's where we're all going to be protected. Everyone will be great over here. Trust me. And then when they get there, everyone's happy, um, including lifting up other females into being a leader in their own industries. What do you think? For you, what does it mean to be a leader? You have to get off any pedestals you have. Mine have all been knocked down. I've made every mistake I think you can make and learned from it, hopefully. So um, I'm not standing on some sort of pedestal saying I've got it all figured out. I know everything. I have I know a lot because I've done a lot of the wrong things or had a lot of failures and I've had a lot of wins. Um, to be learning all the time and asking for help everywhere. So like you and I will sit and brainstorm about a podcast like this a couple of times before we'll actually film it because we want to just talk it out. We want to think of all the things we want to um, get through on an interview that's going to be most impactful, most helpful. Yeah. So <laughs> it's interesting because I think that you mentioned like those that you don't necessarily relate to. Um, and, and a lot of that is because what I've seen is that they – almost play into the female role, right? Like it's not playing into femininity. It's playing into the like, oh, I'm just pretty. And like, you, you, like leveraging, knowing that that gets attention. Right. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I know that like for you, it's like, you're very, like, you, you don't want to be seen as a female CEO. You just want to be seen as a CEO. Do you think that that's like, when you look at alpha leadership, is that kind of where you're steering people? It's like like making your mark, not because you're female, but because you you are a boss. Because you're quality. I have been a fitness trainer. I have been fit and blonde and single and 20 in Southern California. Nothing could have gone better. Um, but I certainly didn't live that life. I immediately got married. I started a business. I was home on the computer and then personal training others, not going to the beach and playing volleyball in my bikini because it's just not where my motivation is and that's not what's going to help others. That feeds my self-esteem, my ego, but I don't have any need for that. Again, it's probably all those wonderful failures that I had in the beginning, but it taught me that that is so shallow and unimportant that that can be somebody's marketing shtick and that might work for them, but that's never going to work for me. Um, I do not want to be a company of software because I'm a female. I want to be a company of software because it's a quality software and it gives good value. It'll help somebody. Yeah, I love that. I think I think that that's important, especially because like as the world kind of moves forward and it's hard to predict where we're going, right, or, or like how things are going to be. Um, but when you look at it, I think that's really, really key is to say like gender doesn't define roles, right? Roles don't define gender, right? And so being a leader or being a CEO, like there's traits and qualities and characteristics and it doesn't matter whether you're male or female or, or whatever you identify as what matters is, is that you 
execute in certain ways in order to essentially get things done, right? Because that's how you build anything. Like it's how you build a good life. That's how you build a big business. It's by actually having the idea, like, and then actually taking that and creating something with it. It's, it's the execution of the idea that matters. And to be able to do that individually and then at scale with a team like it takes someone who has a level of confidence and a, and a level of clarity um, that, that again, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. What matters is, is that you have a, a sense of direction and purpose and, and people can essentially get on that train, right? I mean, the same thing if you're a mom at home and you're having that drive to get your house in order, get your kids in school, you've got your dinner prepared for your husband. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that either. That's great. But you do that same thing. You're doing it with a drive and a purpose. You're doing it with quality and character to improve whatever situation you're in, whether it's a CEO, a mom, or a farmer. Your whole drive and job is to do things with integrity and quality, or it should be. Absolutely. <laughs> anything else you want to share today? I don't think so. Cool. So you mentioned <laughs> earlier that you would love to connect with other CEO, female CEOs. Where is the best place for them to do that? Right now, it's my LinkedIn. <laughs> Honestly, Sarah Jenkins on LinkedIn, CEO of Justice Digital is where you can find me the fastest. I've got a couple websites starting because of the book and they're just not going yet. Yep. They're not up. We'll put the links below when they are up and you guys can check that out. Uh, that's all for today. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. I just have to tell you about Katra, the marketing platform that has seriously transformed my business. You know how running a business can be insanely time consuming, right? Well, Katra has been a game changer for me. It's honestly like having an entire marketing team in my pocket. And what I love most is that it automates all the tedious daily tasks for me, from marketing to sales to even customer experience. I can't believe how much time and energy I've saved since I started using it. And get this. With Kartra, I can create websites, funnels, courses, membership sites, email campaigns, calendars, surveys, you name it. It's made managing my business so much simpler and more affordable. Honestly, I can't recommend Kartra enough. If you're curious, head to paidcreatepodcast.com backslash Kartra to start your trial. Trust me, you won't regret it.